It's like I have to act extra happy so I'm not looked at as bitter because I'm a Black woman and a disabled Black woman at that. If someone says something offensive to me, I have to think about how to respond in a way that does not make me seem like an angry Black woman. That was a quote that I found while reading last year's Women in the Workplace report. The survey, coming from McKenzieandLeanIn.org, is currently the largest study of professional women working in corporate America and Canada. The report is full of amazing stats on professional women's desires and experiences in the workplace. According to McKinsey and Company, the report provides an intersectional look at the specific biases and barriers faced by Asian, Black, Latina, and LGBTQ plus women and women with disabilities. After reading the report, I have been inspired to talk about so, so much. Because although the report does an amazing job at highlighting the challenges that women face in the workplace, it doesn't do the best job at offering effective solutions. It's not for a lack of trying, of course, but rather a lack of understanding the mindset, generational trauma, and energetic dynamics at the root of these issues. Luckily for you, that shit is my zone of genius. We'll talk even more about this study in future episodes, but for today, we're focusing on one of the biggest deterrents that professional women experience in the workplace, microaggressions. This episode is a powerful introduction to overcoming microaggressions so that you can properly serve your industry, you can make the money that you have been called to make, and you can create an environment of safety and security for yourself and the other women around you. Today's episode is full of personal anecdotes, civil rights history, and spiritual concepts, of course. You will leave with a greater understanding of the fact that your purpose and your calling are greater than any resistance you may encounter along the way to your desired position, income, impact, and life. Of course, the episode is for all professional women, not just those working in corporate. And I have to warn you, this is an emotional one. I recorded it at the beginning of the month. It has been an emotional year for me, girl. It really doesn't even matter because it's really, really good. It's really, it's it's something that moved me. It's not like a crying episode. Oh my God, I'm so sad. It's more like a crying episode. Like I feel just the presence, the energy. It's so powerful. (laughs) It's really, really good. Okay. And before we get into it, I've got to remind you that I'm currently available for one-off coaching sessions. You can learn more about working with me and book your session using the links in the show notes or description on YouTube. Also, I'll have the report linked there too. All right. Enjoy. Right now, you're listening to Naked and Noisy, manifestation tools for the professional woman. I'm Natalie Hughes, your host and your coach in this series. In each episode, I'm giving you the tools that you need to create the life you've always dreamed of without the soul-crushing sacrifice that you were taught to endure. Whether you're ready to be treated like the industry leader that you are, you're ready to be drunk in love with your soulmate, or you're ready to wake up to a closet full of Jimmy Choo every morning, this is the podcast for you. Mercury fucking retrograde, bitch. She got me. I'm sitting here crying. (laughs) I'm sitting here crying, telling y'all, the greatest, most heroic story in the world. And I look at this damn computer. (laughs) And not a goddamn thing has been recorded. (laughs) Okay. So fair warning, I probably most likely am absolutely about to cry in this episode. We are having a conversation about purpose. And, um, 
I've been wanting to have a conversation with you guys about dealing with microaggressions in the workplace since like last week, which is why the episodes have been kind of late because I was trying to figure out how to give this conversation to you in the best way. It's an empowering message, but if it's not delivered in a way that actually supports you, then it can turn you off and I didn't want that. So I was wanting to have this conversation about dealing with microaggressions like a leader. And then I started getting some downloads around it. So like the episode started kind of getting built up and around in my head. And then I had a situation that happened at the beginning of the year, kind of sort of come up again. Um, but not really, you know what I'm saying? And I'm going to tell you about that situation and I was talking about civil rights and so then I started crying and now I'm sitting here going, how the hell did I even start that last recording of this? All right, give me a second to take a deep breath (sighs) and let's start from the beginning. This is about so much more than Jimmy Choo and Mocky Mock. And when I say this, I mean you getting into that position of management at your company. You being the head of that corporation. You being one of the women who contributes to the increasing percentage of women-owned businesses that are making more than $1 million. Do you know... And I couldn't find super hard, concrete, recent facts around this. But from what I could find, it was something like between 2 and 3% of women-owned businesses make more than a million dollars, right? Past that million-dollar mark. And I was just like, whoa. It really, really blew my mind because... I'm surrounded by women-owned businesses who are making multi-seven figures. I'm surrounded by women-owned businesses who are making multi-six figures. So I was not aware. It's like I wasn't living in a world where women start businesses and don't make millions from them. Like, that was crazy to me. So as I've been becoming more aware and becoming more familiar with what you, the listener, right? The Mirandas of the world, whether you're an entrepreneur, you're working in corporate, you're an artist, which again, I would consider you to be an entrepreneur. It's like, what are women in business going through? And what I've been realizing and understanding as I've been doing this research is that microaggressions in the workplace are one of the greatest reasons why women aren't moving up the ladder because they feel deterred, because they're not being given opportunities, because they're not being respected, because of the mental, emotional, you know, psychological consequences that microaggressions have on them, right? So I'm like, I know that I want to talk about microaggressions, but I didn't want to just talk about it, um from the stance that I would talk about it, which is like, what? What I'm trying to say is I knew what I wanted to tell you, but I knew that I needed to take some time and figure out how I wanted to deliver that message so that it could actually be well-received, right? Because I know that a lot of women, specifically Black women, there's a lot of, there's a great feeling of responsibility, right? I have to be responsible for the way that I talk. I have to always talk in a super duper happy, excited tone. Otherwise, somebody else might think that I have an attitude, da 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 da, right? I'm responsible for teaching everybody how they're supposed to talk to me and teaching this and da 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 and educating that and just, you know, like there's just that sense of, responsibility and kind of like shit just being a little bit too much for women and for black women specifically. And so if I were to get 
on a podcast, if I was, if I were to, you know, press record and say, hey, it's not your responsibility that people are racist or sexist in the world, but it's your responsibility that they're in your reality. Like if I were to just say that, I don't want to lose you, Miranda. You know what I'm saying? So I had to, I had to actually sit and figure out how am I going to piece this together and how am I going to express this to you, right? That's the short version. The short version is it's not your responsibility that there are people who are racist. It's not your responsibility that there are people who have prejudice against you, right? And I really don't give a shit about racism. I really don't give a shit about prejudice. I really don't give a fuck that there is a man out there who's like, you're a girl and you have emotions and you don't belong in business. I really don't give a fuck. Think what you want to think, say what you want to say, live how you want to live. I really do not give a shit. Sorry for every single woman in your life, but I don't give a fuck about that. But what I do care about is the fact that when somebody comes into your life and they say, you're a girl and you have feelings and you have emotions and you don't belong in business, when they tell you that, Miranda, and that impacts you mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and that hinders you in your progression in the workplace, and that makes you want to back down and that makes you want to go away and that makes you want to do something else, I care about that greatly. It's my mission and my purpose in life to stop that shit immediately, 110%. You know what I'm saying? So when I say it's not your responsibility that there's racists in the world, because fuck it, you want to be dumb, then be dumb. Like, that doesn't have shit to do with me. But when how somebody sees you is what you allow to impact, what you believe you're capable of, or what you're willing to expect in the workplace, how you're willing to expect to be treated, that's when we have a problem. That's when we have an issue. And God, there's a million different ways and and things that we could get into here, but I really want to stay on topic. So I'm going to pause that, take it back, because this episode, technically, this is like how to handle microaggressions in the workplace, part one. And I'm using myself as an example But we'll see what the fuck happens because I don't have hard, concrete notes for this episode. I'm just getting the shit out and we'll see where we land, okay? So that's kind of like the premise, right? That's the foundation. So as I've been thinking about how to communicate this to you, moving through my own triggers, right? I don't want to be a victim blamer. I don't want to be somebody who gets a fuck ton of hate because she's communicating to you in a way that is you know, not compassionate enough. And at the same exact time, I need to keep it real with you. And me being another person, adding bullshit noise, talking about how everybody else is wrong and terrible and horrible and it's all wrong and terrible and horrible. It's like, what do the articles have to say? What is their advice? You've got to tell HR to be even more, you know, strict and we've got to get even better this 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 actually no they're wrong they're wrong and i know a better way and i know a better answer and the better way isn't one where you're saying don't let people be racist (laughs) yes i'm (laughs) i'm not telling you that i think that you know your company should be a playground for racism and sexism that's not the conversation that we're having obviously But what I am saying is that's not your fucking focus. Your focus isn't on how do we stop this from happening? Your focus needs to be on how do we stop this from getting to us in this way? How do we stop this from stopping us? This work, my business, having the receiver's mindset is about more than Jimmy Choo. It's about more than Maki Mock. And if you know me, like if you've listened to any episode of this, I mentioned Jimmy Choo in the intro of this fucking podcast, girl. If you know me, then you know I love fashion. If you know me, then you know I love Maki Mock. If you know me, then you know that one of the goals in my business is to have a closet full of Maki Mock, you know, in my house. So I love Maki Mock just as much as the next girl. And I love Jimmy Choo just as much as the next girl. But this shit is about so much more. 
than Jimmy Choo. It's about more than getting that promotion. It's about more than making the amount of money that you want to make. Okay, so we have to put a pin in that and then I have to catch you up on my personal life just a little bit. Okay, there was a situation that happened at the beginning of this year around like what, February? Maybe like right before my birthday. I don't even fucking remember. It doesn't matter. Do not focus too much on those details. And I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to myself because I believe in focusing on, you know, bad experiences with the intent of processing, period. I don't do wallowing. I don't do sulking. I don't do ranting. I don't do going on and on and on and on and on about the negative shit that happens because what you focus on grows and expands. Your focus and your thoughts create, okay? I consider my focus to be an investment. How am I investing my energy, right? If the energy law of attraction, Abraham Hicks teachings, if the energy that creates worlds flows through me. How am I going to use the energy of creation today? I'm not going to use the energy of creation focusing on the shit that I don't like and that I don't want. But for the intentions of processing how I feel, processing the feelings that negative experiences bring up within me, with the intentions of processing the stories I was telling that attracted those, right? That that situation is reflecting back to me, processing the stories I began telling about who I am and how the world is and what I get to expect as a consequence of those experiences, like all of that's important. So I'm going to focus on that and I'm going to move through that. And once I've moved through that, once I focused on that, baby, I'm on to the next one. Okay. Like the Jay-Z Swiss beat song. There's a million ways to get it. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) And if you don't know that song, you should go listen to it. It's good. I like it. Okay. Let's move on. So there's a situation that happened. I'm trying to figure out everything that I want to bring to the situation. Not too much because of everything I just told you, but enough so that I can communicate everything that you need to understand so that we can all be on the same page and we can all use this as a lesson to move forward, right? So situation happened at the beginning of the year, really triggered me. That situation kind of had like a little reprisal, you know what I'm saying? A little pop back up into my life. Nothing crazy, nothing horrible, nothing bad. Sometimes I believe, and this is just an experience that I've had, sometimes old shit will come back around. Some people call it like a spiritual test or whatever. I I wouldn't phrase it in that way. But sometimes shit comes back around just so that you have the opportunity to see how far you've come. So when this situation came back around for me today, and I didn't freak out and I didn't get scared and I didn't downward spiral, I was in this like mommy mode, which I've really been in with myself lately, which is really lovely. And I'm not talking about nurturing other people or other children. I'm talking about nurturing myself, taking care of myself, protecting myself, just really creating this environment of safety and security for myself. I've been, oh my God, I've been on it lately. So I get in this mode and I'm doing my stuff and I'm handling my shit and I'm feeling more safe and secure than I ever could have imagined that I would feel, especially like a couple of months ago, hearing about this could have It wouldn't have sent me on a downward spiral. I really don't have that experience, especially not recently in my life, but it, it could have impacted me for a couple of days. You know what I'm saying? For maybe even a week. The beginning of this year was very hard for me. Um, not just because of this one situation, but because of this situation and all of these other situations. And now here we are in April, like what, like moving into the second quarter of the year, And, you know, situations are popping up and my demeanor and the way that I've been responding is like, it's blowing my mind. There's just shit happening that, ooh, girl, this is not even a, (laughs) this is not something that I was planning on sharing. So it's going to be 2.5. Okay. And I'm serious. I'm serious, Miranda. Two, 2.5 seconds. I wanted to cuss the other day. So fucking badly. So, so badly. Like you would not believe how badly I wanted to cuss, but I didn't. 
I didn't. And it's Aries season. And I have Mercury in Aries. And Mercury is retrograde in Aries. I wanted to cuss. I wanted to cuss in a way that I have not been tempted to cuss in a long time, probably a couple months. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I had that situation happen. I planned for something. What I planned for didn't happen. Okay. Okay. And even though I planned for something and what I planned for didn't happen, I was like, fuck it. We're going to do a little bit of this. We're going to do a little bit of that. We're going to move some stuff around. We're going to make this happen. And I just handled it like a fucking boss. I was like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And I'm going to leave the rest up to God. And I'm going to let it play out like this. And we're going to handle it like this and this and this. And we're going to make these kind of, you know, challenging decisions. And we're just going to let shit be what shit is going to be. And we know who we are. And we know whose we are. And we know what we're creating. And we know what's ha- we know what's happening. And I know that every single thing that's popping up, that's challenging me and triggering me right now is just an old story that's playing itself out. So I don't even have to even get in this and play this game. I don't even have to get in this and play this game. That's the type of shit that I've been on. Second quarter of 2024. I don't even have to get in this. I don't even have to play this game. Because I know what it is. And I know who I am. Okay? I know what this situation is. And I know what this is. And you can't see me, but I'm making a big gesture, right? I know what this reality is. I know what this time space reality is. Okay. I know what this situation is reflecting back to me. And I know what this time space reality is. I'm talking about the fabric of time space reality. I am talking about the fact that I know that I'm a child of God. I'm talking about the fact that I know that I'm the creator of my reality. I'm talking about, I know what this situation is reflecting back to me and I know who I am and I know what I get to have. I know that I'm creating amazing things. I was going on this rampage before I started recording as I've been moving and and processing and shifting energy. And I was like, no, because this year, this 2024 year, this is not a year of everything's going wrong. This is not a year of one problem after another. No, bitch. This is a year of the better it gets, the better it gets. This is the year of building wealth. This is the year of money and my savings. This is the year of the money stacking up. This is the year of the soul aligned customers and clients pouring into my business. Money and abundance pouring into my business. Money is seeking me out. My Mirandas are seeking me out. Women are ready for growth and expansion. And as I go on this rampage, I can feel the energy shifting in my body. This is a year of growth and expansion. This is a year of you thought 2023 was good. Just you wait, okay? So I'm really in my power is what I'm trying to convey here. I'm really in my power. So I'm trying to figure out what do I want to share about this thing. I'm going to give you the best summary that I have, right? Angry white woman, jealous resentful, bitter, powerless, who likes to take out her frustrations on young women, specifically her daughters. I'm not talking about my mother. Young women in general. White woman who is falsely under the impression that this young black woman can be bullied. That's the best I got for you. Okay. That's the best I've got for you right now. So that happened at the beginning of the year. Really scary stuff with my business. What's happening. Did I do something wrong? Did I protect myself correctly? Da 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 da, right? Just lots of fears coming up. Totally normal, totally valid. There was just shit coming up. It was like financial shit coming up, business shit coming up, like professional shit coming up, legal shit coming up. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like it was just a fucking lot, right? So now I'm finally getting to a place where, bitch, I'm feeling safe. I'm feeling safe. I'm safe, secure. I'm good. And I didn't get to that place of feeling safe and secure and good because I waited out and I did nothing and I just let time pass. Eh, Wrong answer. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know that um, meme from the Proud Family? Wrong answer, forehead. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's move on. So... <laughs> No, I'm sorry. That's just really funny. Okay, okay, okay. Refocus. I didn't do that every single day. I EFT tapped. I meditated. I went on rampages. I journaled. I brought up my fears. I did breath work. I, on my shit, man, on my shit. Every day for the past several months, like I do every day for, you know, the past several years, right? So... I've been handling my stuff and I'm now noticing, okay, I'm feeling more safe. I'm feeling more secure. No matter what's happening in my physical reality, I'm feeling safe and secure. I'm feeling empowered, right? Super good stuff. So then that situation kind of came up again today. Eh, nothing to be worried about. Nothing to be afraid of. Literally nothing to be worried about and nothing to be afraid of. And, you know, it was one of those things where you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to respond and go, I'm so afraid, the sky is falling. What if this negative thing happens? And you also have an opportunity to respond in a different way. You have the opportunity to respond in an empowered way. You have the opportunity to pause, get tuned in, tapped in, turned on to who the fuck you are and let the shit be the shit, right? Amanda Francis calls it ants on the ground. Everything else is ants on the ground. And I don't have time. I don't have time. This shit is bigger than Maki Mock. This shit is bigger than bitter white women. This shit is bigger. I don't have time. I don't know how to respond for to that. ants on the ground. Please. We just have to cut the iPad off. We just have to we just have to. Because I'm not saying the S word. Okay. Refocus. This shit is so much bigger than something that might make you feel scared, make you feel worried. I'm just trying to make sure that I'm communicating this in the best way that I can communicate this to you so that we can all be on the same page, right? Something came into my reality today that had this come into my reality a couple months ago, had this come into my reality a couple years ago at the beginning of my business, bitch. I would have been ready to pack this shit up. (laughs) And um, today, it's a completely different energy. It's a completely different response. And the reason why I have a completely different energy and a completely different response is because this shit is about so much bigger than Maki Mock. It's about so much bigger than a Mercedes SUV. It's about so much bigger. And even though I love Maki Mock and I love the SUV and I love the creative self-expression, like that's an important thing too. And so I don't want to, you know, Talk about it like it's not an important thing. Who cares about Maki Mock? I love fashion and I love creative self-expression. And it's like, that's such an important thing, but it's bigger. It's bigger. Because, and I'm trying to think of, do I get into this now? When I recorded this the first time, I was crying about something completely different when I started recording, re-recording this episode, y'all. So I'm like, are we even going to talk about <laughs> the thing that made me cry this episode? We'll, we'll just trust that it's all coming together. Okay, focus. It's about so much bigger. Because... I'll start first with my family. And I'm not talking about my family like my mother, who is really the only family that I consider myself to have outside of like, you know, like my soul family, cheetah sisters, you know what I'm saying? But just like blood relatives, I would consider my mother to be the only family that I have. So it's not really about that family. It's about my family, like my kids. It's about future generations, right? And when I give in to fear, how am I going to say this? How am I going to say this? 
I'll say this. I personally would be damned to hell before my black ass kids ever lived in a reality where because a white person didn't like you, didn't like what you said, didn't like da 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 da, that they some way, somehow got to take away the business that you worked hard to build, to create, that you fought for. The way that I do family and the way that I do future generations and the way that I belief in parenting, which you don't have to listen to because I don't have kids. And there's a lot of people who are very stupid who think that you shouldn't listen to parenting advice from people who don't have kids. So it's like, fine, if you want to wait for me to drop my last name, get married, and for me to crack some eggs, have kids, and for me to raise those kids, if you want to wait all of those decades to take this bomb mess advice, baby, good luck and more power to you. But I'm going to share what the fuck I know to be true in my heart and in my soul. I don't think that kids do what you say. They do what you do, right? So assume that your kids were never, ever, 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 ever going to listen to a word that came out of your fucking mouth. They were not going to listen to any of it. Your kids were never going to listen to you. They were never going to take your advice. But what they were going to do... Uh Uh-oh, hold on. I'm getting a text message, but I need to focus. Oh, love that, but I need to focus. Okay. (sighs) Assuming that your kids are not going to listen to a damn thing that you say, but what they are going to do is everything that you do, every action that you take, how you operate in the world is how your children are going to operate in the world. And when I think about how I want my kids to operate in this world... On a spiritual level, on an emotional level, on a physical level, if the devil walks up to you and you are face to face, I want you to spit. Do you understand what I'm saying? There is no fear in my heart. There is no worry in my heart. There is no stress in my heart. When it comes to the idea, the notion that any human being, fucking ant on the ground, could ever undermine, come between, negatively impact or impede what I have come here to build, to create, to give to the world, the gifts that I was born to deliver to the world... Everybody, let's just take five. (laughs) Everybody, let's just take some deep breaths. Let's just just do a quick meditation. (sighs) I don't think so. I don't think so. That's not how I live. That's not how I parent. I don't think that parenting happens... The second that you get pregnant, I don't think that parenting happens the second that you adopt a child. I don't think that parenting happens the second that the baby is born. I think that you are a parent. If you're somebody who plans to have kids, I think you are a parent 24 fucking seven because you're not going to change who you are and how you are and what you believe and how you operate. You're not going to develop the self-worth to get everything that you want in the world within that nine month window of you finding out that you're pregnant. Becoming empowered is not the thing that you do when you find out that you're pregnant. And I'm not saying if you're listening to this and you're pregnant that it's too late or you got kids. I'm not ever telling you that it's too late, but I'm telling you who I am and I'm telling you what I'm creating and I'm telling you what I know. And by the time that I bring children into this world, 
my confidence, my self-esteem, and my ability to create an environment of safety and security for myself and for my children, that shit needs to be ironclad. Is that the phrase? If it's not the phrase, make it the fucking phrase. (laughs) If it's not the phrase, make it the phrase. (laughs) I need to be safe and I need to be secure and I need to be stable and I need to be confident in that. And I think a lot of people's version of safety and security and stability looks like being immovable and inflexible, (laughs) unflexible, inflexible. I don't know. But just being stiff. That's not safety. That's not security. That's not stability. Safety and security and stability is being able to be a boat on the ocean who can sway with the waves, something that can go in flow when what is it? Architects, engineers are creating buildings. They create buildings. If you're creating a skyscraper, you're going to create a building that can flow just a bit with the wind. You're going to create a building that can move in such a way so that like, you know, with earthquakes, the building needs to be able to sway. So safety and security and stability is not about, you know, having a life that never changes, having you know, a life where everything is always rainbows and sunshine and happiness, safety and security and stability is having a life experience where no matter what the fuck happens, I know that I'm good. No matter what the fuck happens, I know that I can create an environment of safety and security for myself. I know that I can take care of myself. I know that I can take care of others. That has been one of like the biggest, biggest goals for me in my life, just in general, but especially when it comes to motherhood and having kids is that you better be fucking stable stable as fuck so stable that a hurricane tsunami tornado could not knock you off your fucking feet bitch you need to be stable as fuck this work is bigger it's bigger than a bitter white lady it's it's bigger It's bigger than a white woman who's projecting her bullshit onto you. It's bigger than a white woman who's miserable and who's convinced that she needs to get somebody else to be miserable with her. It's bigger than the white people who be on a fucking power trip. And because when they say jump, you don't say how high they get mad. Bitch try to put you in your quote unquote place. It's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. It's the fact that I have to create an environment of safety and security and stability for me because my kids have to be born with it. It has to be in them and not on them. And when you don't have shit but forced, fake, superficial, positive shit to say to your kids, then it's on them and it's not in them. But when you live it and you embody it and it's you every single day, whether the cameras are rolling or nobody is looking, when you are in a dark room and it is just you, God, and the devil, who you are, that is what your kids will be. That is what they will emulate. So for me, I don't have a choice but to operate in integrity and I don't have a choice but to walk it like I talk it, so to speak, because I care deeply about the foundation that I am building my family on. That's important. So when it comes to business and when it comes to microaggressions and when it comes to silly little petty bullshit, you can't throw me off my game because it's not just about the business. It's about my livelihood. It's about my ability to take care of my kids. It's about the example that I want to set for future generations. It's about the fact that my kids are going to grow up and they're going to go off into the world. Why are you crying? (laughs) Oh my God. I'm on my period a little bit. (laughs) A little bit. (laughs) time for me. I've been crying for like the past three days, but not like 
not like sad, terrible, you know, like, oh my God, this guy is fine. Like not tears like that, but just like, bitch, I've been processing and I just been so emotional lately. Anyway, Beyonce came out with this album, fabulous album, obviously. It's called Cowboy Carter, if you haven't heard of it. And uh, one of the songs is called Protector. And she's basically saying what I've just said here. And she's just saying, you know, I know that at some point one day you're going to shine on your own, but for now I'm going to be here and I'm, I'm going to project for you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to, you know. And my kids who I'm not pregnant don't exist in this physical reality yet. My kids are going to grow up and they're going to go off into the world one day. And I have already committed to not being a helicopter mom and you know being like a smoldering smothering force they're gonna go off into the world they're gonna live their own life they're gonna do their own thing and I can't be there for every single person who might not like them who might not respect them who might not agree with them on something who might not like their ideas who might not think that they're good enough who might not think that they have what it takes who might not think that they're qualified because of the color of their skin or how many letters are in their name or the way that it's spelled or because of their gender or because of the way that they present themselves or because of how loud they talk or you know if they're like me maybe they do have mercury in aries and sometimes it just sounds like they're fucking angry when they're not angry <laughs> I listened to that podcast episode, you know, the one right before this one, before I posted it. And I'm like, why the fuck are you yelling? <laughs> why are you angry? I wasn't angry. I was just really feeling the energy very strongly. It was just pouring out of me. <laughs> That's conviction in my voice. It's not anger. <laughs> I can't be there all the time. What? You think you want your mom sitting in the corner of the boardroom? <laughs> <laughs> yelling every single time somebody perceives you incorrectly somebody says something mean to you somebody does something that hurts your feelings you want that experience no i don't just think about having kids like i want cute little things to dress up even though i do think that way because i'm very fashionable and i love kids and oh my god kids in cute little outfits <laughs> I love that, yes. But more than that, I want human beings who are living and giving their soul's essence and just getting everything that they've come here to earth for, right? For them to be able to do that, then I've got to do this. That's what it means to be a generational curse breaker. Hiding is a generational curse. Pretending is a generational curse. Not giving your gifts out into the world is a generational curse. And it might not be a generational curse in your family, but it's a generational curse in my family. It is a generational curse in my family. Beyonce released this country album and I cried because my grandfather on my mother's side is from Texas. My grandparents on my mother's side are from Texas. And my grandfather on my father's side was a country singer. And I know from stories that I've heard, he passed away when I was very young, like one years old, you know. I know from stories that I've heard, like years ago, there was a country legend musician guy who died. And I believe this was like 2021. So I was living with my cousin who is, we have the same grandfather, right? This is my father's side. And I had like shared that with her. And she was like, oh yeah, like grandpa used to um, play with, uh, you know, X, Y, Z different guy. And I'm like, that's crazy. This guy is in like the fucking country hall of fame and like all this shit. And it just started really hitting me. My grandfather was incredibly talented he was a country singer. I know that he also played the guitar. Maybe he had other musical talents. I'm not sure. But my 
grandfather could have been an amazing country legend. And my father, I was thinking on my father's side. <laughs> yeah, my father. You usually only have one of those. My, not, I'm talking biologically. Anyway, move on. My father, when he was younger, he's dead now. <laughs> In his life, oh my God. He played football when he was in like high school and he was in college and he was really, really good. And he um, could have played pro football, which I'm happy that he did because if he did not become addicted to crack, he probably wouldn't have met my mother. Nope. <laughs> my mother wasn't addicted to crack. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If my father hadn't hit his own upper limit when it came to football because of addiction, because of injury, because of blah, blah, blah. If that hadn't happened, then he probably would have went on to play football professionally. He was very good at the sport. And then if he had gone on to play football professionally, then he probably would not have met my mother and I probably would not have been born. So thank you, crack. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's my life. It's my life. I can tell the jokes that I want to tell. And it's my podcast. Let's move on. So that happened, right? And then on my mother's side, my grandfather is a genius. My grandmother, she, what the hell didn't she do? I'm actually very similar to my grandmother in a lot of ways. She was really into fashion. She was really into clothes. She sewed. She had her own, like, business, but it wasn't a business like this business. I think she just had a business where she would, like, sew stuff. Maybe, like, it was, like, fur, like, hats or something like that. These are stories that I don't know that I need to know and I will ask. But, um, you know, she sewed clothes and she sold clothes and she was incredibly creative. And um, she also was a woman who like prayed and she spoke in church and she, you know, like the church would call her to like pray and like lay hands on like sick people and heal them. And so that, you know, really resonates with who I am as a person. Anyway, the point is getting really good in your career, starting to get successful in your career and then hitting an upper limit and then self-sabotage and then low self-worth or not getting your gifts out, people not knowing you, not being able to support yourself with your business, with your anything, right? That's a generational curse that runs in my family. It stops with me. It's bigger. It's bigger than a bitter white bitch in the middle of fucking nowhere from God knows where. It's bigger. It's bigger. It's generational. When you don't have the receiver's mindset, when you don't have self-worth, you can't be the best mom that you can possibly be. It's about so much bigger than Maki Mock. And the example that I'll give is a woman who's no longer my friend. I think I mentioned her um, maybe like two podcast episodes ago. It doesn't really matter. But a woman who's no longer my friend. She's a baby, right? She's a baby girl, a toddler. And this was like the fall of last year. And we had reconnected. So she's got this baby girl. She's got this toddler, lovely angel. And um, when we had connected, the toddler was sick. She was under the weather. She wasn't feeling very good, right? So the toddler was with her father while the mom was working. She was doing my nails, blah, 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 whatever. So she went to go pick up the toddler. We still wanted to hang out. So she was going to pick up the toddler and maybe we're going to go, you know, hang out at my house, hang out at her house, do whatever, whatever. So we go to her house and we pick up her toddler who is under the weather and, you know, she's talking to her baby's father and then we get back to our house and she tells me that the baby's dad gave the baby the wrong dose of medication, right? And, you know, she's like, 
she's supposed to give her this much and he gave her too much and when I told him that he gave her too much he just like shrugged it off he didn't care blah 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 right and here's the thing babies toddlers sensitive creatures right your body is growing and developing you're acclimating to life on earth with babies things can kind of go from bad to worse very quickly and easily they're very sensitive wrong dose of medication whether or not she's fine it shows a level of carelessness and then when you find out that you've given her the wrong dose of medicine, you just shrug your shoulders. It doesn't mean anything. If I have that experience, I can't tell you what I would do if I had that experience. Like, literally. Because I, can't, I cannot get on this podcast and tell you that I would commit murder. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying I just no that's just the type of person whom I am I'm a very fiercely protective person I'm a fiercely protective person of myself I'm a fiercely protective person of the people who I love I obviously will be a very fierce protector of my children we just talked about it in this episode right But my ex-friend wasn't. Why? Because she has low self-worth. Because people get to treat her like shit. That man, members of her family, people she's in relationships with, whatever. There's no shame. There's no guilt. It is what the fuck it is. These are the facts of the case. People get to treat you like shit. And they get to continue to hold the positions that they hold in your life. People get to treat you like shit. They don't have to change their ways. They don't have to grow and expand. They don't have to apologize. People don't have to watch the way that they speak to you. You have no standards around how you are treated. You allow yourself to be treated like shit. You have low self-worth. So you don't have the capacity to go to bat for and fight for your child. And it doesn't matter what you say when the cameras are rolling. It doesn't matter what you say when eyes are on you. It doesn't matter what the fuck I'm saying on this podcast. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What matters is what happens when I'm done recording. What matters is when I, what I do, like I've already said in this podcast, when I am in a dark room by myself, it is me, myself, God, and the devil. That's what the fuck matters. Because it is from that place that I will respond when it's time to protect my kids, my loved ones. You don't have self-worth. You don't have the receiver's mindset. Self-worth is when you know that you're an important, significant person who matters and belongs. She doesn't believe that she's an important person. She doesn't believe that it matters how she feels. She doesn't believe that it matters that she's taken care of. She doesn't believe that it matters that she feels safe. She doesn't believe that it matters that she's respected. She doesn't feel that she's an important person. She doesn't feel that she's a significant person. She does not perceive herself to belong to the group of people who are respected, taken care of, supported, protected. She has low self-worth. She does not identify in those ways. And from that place, you cannot raise a daughter who has self-worth. Because what happens? You can all day, look at the affirmations that I do with my daughter. It looks really cute on Instagram. It might get you likes, might make you go viral. Other superficial people might applaud you and say, oh my God, good job, great, that is so amazing. That little girl is not going to grow up to love, honor, and respect herself because you told her that she should love, honor, and respect herself. She's going to grow up and she's going to behave just like you behave. And not only is she going to grow up and behave the way that you behave, but She's also going to grow up and behave in that way because you allow her to be treated in those ways because of how you treat yourself. 
when you don't have self-worth, you don't think you're important, you don't believe that you're worthy of being treated better, you're not willing to set expectations and to hold those standards and expectations, then somebody does some potentially incredibly dangerous, irresponsible shit to your child. And you will do nothing but complain and make passive aggressive comments and allow that resentment to build. And resentment does not save the life of your child. Passive aggressiveness does not create an environment of safety and security for your child. That's what the receiver's mindset is about. The woman who has the receiver's mindset is the woman who has self-worth. I have to know that how I feel is important. I have to know that how I feel is significant. I have to know that how I feel matters. I have to know that I belong to the group of women who are respected and seen and supported and taken care of. I have to know that. Because if I don't know it, not only will I suffer, but my kids will suffer. It's about more than having the clothes and the shoes and the cars and the home and the money in the bank and the respect in your field. When you walk into that office and you speak and you expect to be heard, when you walk into the room and you expect to be respected, you're not just walking and talking and speaking and thinking and delivering on behalf of yourself, but you are walking and talking and speaking and thinking and delivering on behalf of your entire fucking lineage. Previous generations, future generations, this is about so much more than who doesn't like you. This is about so much more than who's jealous and who doesn't want you to succeed. This is about so much more than who wants to be fucking petty. This is about so much more than who wants to quote unquote put you in your place. This is about the well-being of your fucking family lineage. And I was going to talk about even more stuff, but hello. Hello. Mother Earth, the planet that we live on, she's not doing good. She's not doing the best that she's ever been doing. I need environmental activists. No, let me be even more specific. I need environmental scientists. I need environmental lawyers. I need legislators. I need lawyers, legislators, and scientists to be women. They don't have to be women, but they need to be people. And this is a podcast for professional women, so I'm talking to you. They need to be women who have self-worth. It's about more than Mocky Mock, and it's about more than Jimmy Choo. Because when they say that you don't belong here because of your race and you don't belong here because of your age and you don't belong here because of your skin tone or because of your sex, when they tell you that you don't belong and you believe them, who does that serve? That hyper-masculine way of being that way of being that is out of balance, hyper-masculine, meaning I don't give a fuck about how you feel. I don't give a fuck about how you feel. I don't give a fuck about what you need. I don't give a fuck about your well-being. That hyper-masculine culture, that no work-life balance culture is the same exact culture that is killing the earth. Because we live in a world where nobody gives a fuck about how they feel. And giving a fuck about how you feel is not just going, that thing that they did totally sucked and I hated it. I can't believe they did that thing. Being somebody who gives a fuck about how they feel is caring enough about how you feel to act. Caring enough about how you feel to show up. Caring enough about how you feel to expect something different. I need a lawyer, a legislator, and a scientist. I need a group. I need a population. 
I need a majority of lawyers, legislators, and scientists to have self-worth and self-respect. I need you to know that it matters what you think and how you feel and what you need. I need you to know that it matters what you think is the best for this planet and for this country. I need you to know that it matters. I need you to know that it matters. Because there's a whole bunch of women walking around who have low self-worth. There's a whole bunch of women who are walking around who thinks that it doesn't matter how they feel. That it doesn't matter how they're treated. And it's not true. You're not just being treated like shit in your relationships. You're not just being treated like shit in your job. You're being treated like shit in your country. You're being treated like shit in the world because there are different people. There are corporations who are making choices and decisions that are not in your best interest. But because you're telling the story that you're powerless, there's nothing you can do. Are you going to stand by and allow them to murder your earth, your home? While you tell the story that you're powerless and there's nothing you can do about it because they have more money and they have more resources and they have more of this and this and this. Or are you going to boss the fuck up and be a goddamn leader? Are you going to start asking yourself the important questions like how the fuck can I get in that room and how can I stand in that room confident? In the direction that this company needs to go in, confident in the direction that my family needs to go in, confident in the direction that my money and my finances need to go in, confident in the direction that this world needs to go in, period. How do I get myself to that place of confidence? How do I get myself to that place of being aligned with my inner being? Changing the earth is a decentralized movement. It's a decentralized effort. That means it's no, no one leader. No one leader, no one person. A lot of people telling the story of powerlessness, waiting for somebody to come save them. Saw a video, it was on um, Twitter the guy there there were people in like fucking Maryland or something and they're like look at our tap water somebody has to come and do something about this he's in a fucking video grown ass man talking about somebody needs to come and do something about this you you the somebody it's your house it's your apartment it's your city You're the leader. You're the person who has to save you. You're the person who has to believe in you. This work is so incredibly important because who am I? What what is going to happen? Okay. If whatever with the white woman happened and I said, oh my God, I have to shut down my business. I'm going to lose everything. (laughs) <laughs> there's no danger of anything being lost it's nothing like that well no just stop it right there what happens if i walk away from this business you don't get served through this podcast there's no business protecting me and my personal assets What happens if I shut down this business? You don't get served. You don't get served. Your company doesn't get served. The black woman who's a couple of years younger than you in college right now, hoping that she's going to be able to get a job so that she can pay off those fucking predatory ass student loans that she took out the black woman who is a couple years behind you. She doesn't get served because you're not getting served because this content stops. Mother Earth, who is doing nothing but being this incredibly, unconditionally loving, amazing, wonderful presence for us all. I love planet Earth. 
Like I really like, I really, really, really love nature. I love trees and I love birds and I love the ocean and I love... <laughs> I'm so serious right now. I love planet Earth. And I'm laughing because I'm crying. Planet Earth. That is so fucking beautiful. And she has done so much for us. And she has provided so much for us. I know that the legislators and I know that the lawyers and I know that the scientists are listening I know that you are because you have to be because it's my destiny to be here and it's your destiny for you to be here listening to this. I know that you are and I know that you need me to speak because I'm the only person who can speak in this very particular way so that you can understand it in your own particular way so that you can make the choices and decisions and you can receive the downloads. The only way for you to get through that is for you to go through me. So no. Just because a weird, bitter bitch somewhere is jealous and upset and angry and da 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 <sighs> This business isn't going any fucking where. <laughs> I talked for an hour to get to that point. This business isn't going any motherfucking where. And I didn't even know that I was going to be talking about this situation when I was planning this fucking episode. But the shit is perfect. This shit is perfectly fucking timed. Who the fuck do you think you are to ever threaten me, my business, my livelihood, this God's work that I'm doing? No further comments. No further comments. This shit is so much bigger than shoes. It's so much bigger than money. Reverend Shuttlesworth is somebody who I learned about when I took a trip to Birmingham, Alabama. And this episode might be an hour and 30 minutes long, okay? Just might be. Maybe that'll be a different episode. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. We will cry. We will all cry as a community <laughs> about Reverend Shuttlesworth tomorrow. It's not a sad story. It's an amazing story and it's an empowering story. But I'm going to give you this rundown really quickly. We're going to wrap it up. We're going to bring it all together. and We're going to figure out what the hell we're going to title this episode. Racism was a thing. And sexism was a thing when Harriet Tubman was doing her thing, right? That's like the whole thing, right, with, with the Underground Railroad? Because if racism and sexism weren't a thing and oppression wasn't a thing, then I'm pretty sure that, you know, Harriet and the other people wouldn't have been enslaved in the first place and they could have just been like, hey, I'm actually out of here, so... <laughs> I'm actually just going to leave. Thanks. <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> thanks for the invite, but no thanks. <laughs> they would have just RSVP'd no to the colonization party, right? <laughs> they would have said, mm, don't feel like a boat ride today, but thank you. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. And I'm not talking about Harriet Tubman. I'm talking about like all black people everywhere. But anyway. Harriet Tubman experienced racism. Harriet Tubman experienced sexism. You don't think that Madam C.J. Walker experienced racism and sexism? Because we have to give an example of a woman in business, a professional woman, a woman after my own heart. Martin Luther King experienced racism. Reverend Shuttlesworth experienced racism. How do you deal with microaggressions in the workplace like a leader? You recognize that this shit is about so much bigger. This shit is about so much bigger.
You have faith in something greater. You have belief in something greater. You have an understanding of that something greater. Of all that is pulling for you to win. Of all that is in favor and aligned with your destiny. When it's time, it's time. And we will talk about Reverend Shuttle's worth. I went to Birmingham, Alabama. I can't get into all of the story parts that I want to get into because y'all know I don't want to make this two hours long, okay? Long story short, I'm traveling, 2020, pandemic. I'm in Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm looking up places because I want to learn. I love history. I love American history. I love African-American history specifically. So I'm, you know, I'm in Birmingham, Alabama. What can I see? What can I learn? And I was guided to that church, right? Found it on Google. Pull up. It's kind of like, there's kind of like two churches. There's plaques everywhere. So you kind of like can walk this like block, right? It's like a church and another church and then like houses. And then they got like these like plaques around, like stuck into the ground, like these like posts, right? So you go and you read about Reverend Shuttlesworth and I highly suggest you Google him. And he was just an amazing civil rights activist. And one of the things that he, okay, two stories that I want to share. One, I was reading a plaque. He was like doing something, protesting, running with the police, right? Um, Maybe they're being arrested. Something is happening. And his daughter, he has a daughter and a son. From what I remember in the story, there might be more kids and it might not be a daughter and a son. I'm pretty sure it was though, but I don't remember. And I think his daughter asked him, referencing the police, she's like, can they hurt us? And at the time, Birmingham, Alabama at the time. And I don't remember if it was while this was happening or if it was just like in retrospect, but I'm pretty sure it was while it was happening. They were calling Birmingham, Alabama, bombing him because of how frequently it was being bombed. Because, you know, they didn't want segregation. So if you're a black family, you move into this white neighborhood, we're going to bomb your fucking house. Get out of here. You're not safe to be here, right? You're in Birmingham, Alabama. You're being arrested, you're being harassed, you're being this, you're being that. Your child looks at you and says, can they hurt us? And he replies to his daughter and he says, no, they can't hurt us. And it moves me every time. Because in the middle of this fucking adversity... This shit is getting real. And anybody else could look from the outside and see that you are in danger. One of the first places that I went in Birmingham, Alabama was to the church that those little girls were killed in a bombing. Your child asks you, can they hurt us? And you respond, no, they can't hurt us. And the second story that ties powerfully into this story is sometimes he slept in his church. Reverend Shuttlesworth sometimes slept in his church. And I don't think he was living there, but I know that sometimes he slept there. And this is just off of my memory, okay? This is just literally what I remember reading when I was there in 2020, okay? And so one night he was, I think this was around Easter or Christmas time, I think. So one night he was in his church and he was asleep and his church was bombed. His church was bombed. And so, of course, the church collapses and the people of like the, you know, surrounding neighborhood. They're coming out and they're like, you know, they finally got him. He's gone. They bombed the church. He was asleep in there. He's dead. (laughs) 
And right when you think it's over, this man who was asleep, who had just been bombed, starts climbing out from under the fucking rubble. Like, what? Your church was bombed while you slept? The most, quote-unquote, defenseless a human being could ever be? And this is where I was crying (laughs) when I realized that the episode wasn't recording. The most defenseless that a human being can be. And the enemy still. (sighs) It's just one of those stories that you hear, things that you experience, and I'm there in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm there where this shit happened. And it just, it's one of those things that changes you forever. It's one of those things that shifts you. It's one of those things that just changes something within you. It's one of those things that elevates your faith like never before. It's one of those, it's one of those testimonies that just hits in your heart and in your soul. It's one of those moments I remember just having a conversation with my ancestors and and with my spirit guides and just this like, like, fuck it. Like, (laughs) how am I trying to say this? Like, fuck it. I'm all in. There's nothing you could do to me. There's nothing you could do to me. I know it and I see it and I feel it and I've lived it. I've embraced it. I have experienced it by being there, feeling the energy of that place, feeling the energy of everything that happened. It was like a spiritual activation within me. I'm done. I've been to Birmingham, Alabama. You cannot stop me. I'm I'm on the path. I'm on the other side. It's just a matter of walking the shit out at this point in time. There is no such thing. There is nothing that could ever stop me. There is nothing that could ever deter me. There is nothing that could ever impede me because I was there and I saw and I experienced experienced and I read and I was shifted and I was changed in his most vulnerable, in his most vulnerable. The enemy still could not hurt that man. Because when it's time, it's time. When it's time for change, it is time for change. And you can hate it and you can bomb it and you can curse it and you can get your tiki torches and you can gather and you can form a mob and you can do whatever the fuck you want. You could have my GPS coordinates and I would still be safe. There is nothing. No man, no bitter bitch (laughs) in the world that could ever stop what I have created, what I am creating. And this is not a mentality, a mindset, a belief system that I developed overnight. This is some shit that I've been working on. You know, for my whole life, but we could even say since 2020. What is it now? 2024? (sighs) What I'm trying to say is when it's time, it's time. And when you don't have mindset tools when you don't have emotional tools when you don't have the ability to overcome your doubts the ability to overcome your fears 
the ability to overcome your perceived limitations. When you don't have that ability, you will give up. You will run away. You will self-sabotage. You will be disappointed. You will tell the story that it's not safe for you to receive, that it's not safe for you to elevate, that it's not safe for you to grow and expand, that, oh, I didn't want to work in that industry that bad anyway, knowing good and damn well that it's your dream and that it's your destiny to be there. You will hold yourself back if you don't have these tools. You will give into, some people call it the devil. I consider it to be limiting beliefs. It's all the same shit. You will give into the devil every single time. If you don't have a concrete mindset, you don't have shit. It doesn't matter what you learned. It doesn't matter since you got your degree and you know every fucking thing. It doesn't matter. How come they told us to go to college to get a good job and then we get to college and now we still can't get a good job and all of the things. Nobody wants bachelor's degrees anymore. I have to have a master's degree. And then, and then, and then, and then. Why is that experience happening? It's not a conspiracy. It's because there's nothing that you can do with your physical action. There's no suit you can put on. There's no dress you can wear. There's no shoes you can buy. There's no way that you can learn to speak. There is nothing you can do with your physical action that will ever compensate for what you lack energetically, for what you lack in belief, for what you lack in your mindset. You thought that what you needed to do to get money was to get the degree and blah, 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 and to get more trainings and to get X, Y, Z, different person to like you, but that's not true. What you needed to get the money and to get the success and to grow and expand in your career was to have that feeling of self-worth, to know that you deserve it. To feel worthy of it. To know that you have the power to create a life where you're living it. To know that it's your birthright, your motherfucking birthright. Inherently, it is yours. Things change so drastically for me and my business, just from an energetic standpoint, just from a feeling standpoint. When I look at this shit, like this is my inheritance. This this shit is guaranteed. This is the shit that I'm passing down to my kids. This, This shit is done. I'm not having a conversation with you on what you think. I'm not having a conversation trying to convince you to do something else, behave in a different way. I'm not having a conversation with fear. I'm not having a conversation with anxiety. I'm not having a conversation with worry. I'm not having conversations with stress anymore because I know who I am and I know whose I am and I know where I'm going and I know what the fuck this year is for me. I know what the fuck this business is for me. I know what I have built. I know what I have moved towards. I know what I'm creating. I know that I have the power to create and when you have that mindset that's what gets you success and successful people might not say those things directly not because i hate when people do that this is what rich people don't want you to know i think it's fucking stupid (laughs) i'm sure there might be some people who are like we don't want them to know this but i don't think that it's that i think it's more so an experience where People who are already successful, people who are already wealthy, they're already telling these stories subconsciously. Just like you've been telling the story subconsciously that you're not respected in the workplace, just like you've been telling the story that you're not safe and secure because you're a black woman or because you're a woman, you know, you've been telling that story subconsciously and you've just never looked at it. You've never dealt with it. You've never moved it around. You've never shifted it. You've never released it. You've never decided to build out the belief that you're safe and secure and divinely protected. You've never built out the belief that you're inherently worthy of money and all that you desire, right? But they were born with those beliefs. Because why? Because their parents lived in that. Hello. Hello. 
I don't think that one of my favorite examples to give is Beyonce's beautiful family. I don't think that that adorable baby girl, Blue Ivy, is ever going to have an experience where she has difficulty getting 70,000 people to show up for a show. Because she's already had the life experience of 70,000 people screaming, Blue Ivy. I know I was one of them. I was crying at the show. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. Oh, so powerful. Renaissance tour, I miss you. She might have other limiting beliefs or different things like that. That's none of our business. But the point is, there was a Kelly Rowland video. And I think they were interviewing her and they were asking about Blue Ivy or something like that. And, you know, how she worked so hard or something like that. And Kelly was like, how could she not work hard? How could she not show up and, you know, train practice and all of that good stuff? Look at her parents. What does she watch her parents do? And then you see videos of Blue Ivy over the years. I just retweeted one the other day. And it was a, a performance, right? Beyonce's on stage. She's performing and... Uh, Jay-Z is in the audience, the camera's on Jay-Z and Blue Ivy's there and you know to the beat, I'm assuming in alignment with Beyonce's choreo, Blue Ivy is you know, she's moving her hands she's doing the dance and Jay-Z looks at her and you see this beautiful, why are you crying? (laughs) You see this beautiful moment of this man looking at his daughter, he's like, are you are you doing the choreography? And then like that part in the song hits again and she does it again. And he's like, oh my God. He looks at the camera. He's like, are you guys catching this on camera? Like, <laughs> do you see my daughter doing this dance? <laughs> do you see her learning this choreo? Like, you know this song? <laughs> you know this dance? <laughs> when you live it and it's who you are and you have children then it's in them not on them Beyonce and Jay-Z didn't have to sit and have a conversation with their child about I mean they probably did you know have the conversation because emotional maturity of processing emotions da, 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 da. but watching the renaissance um, movie the tour movie right and they talk about Blue Ivy and they talk about she wanted She heard the negative shit and she wanted to show up. She wanted to practice more. She wanted to get back on that stage. And mm, this is the best way that I can describe it. Show the world what she can do. How many people would do that? How many people do you know that would do that? If you were a kid and you had a whole bunch of adults on the internet fucking losers talking shit about you when you're just doing your best. Do you know how scary that is to even get on stage and remember those moves? Fuck. (laughs) Like, she has my honor. She has my respect. To be able to do that and experience that criticism and your response is let me get back out there. Why would you have that response? Because it's in you. It's in your heart. It's in your soul. It's in your inner being. But it's also in your blood. It's in your DNA. It's in your parents. It's in who they are. It's how they conduct themselves. It's how they live. Before the tour, what happened? We have Beyonce release the Break My Soul remix. Release your anger. That's okay. I can take it. I'm built for this. You see your mom going through and moving through and transforming whatever she's transforming privately. You see your mom, this fucking warrior woman. And you experience some negativity. You experience some hate. You're literally not going to do what your parents said because your parents were like, we don't think you should go on stage in the first place. (laughs) I'm pretty sure that's what they said, right? You're not going to do what your parents say. You're going to do what your parents do. And what the fuck does your mom do? 
She shows up. She works hard. What's the fucking lyric? Why are you crying? <laughs> I'm sorry. This shit just really is really hitting me. I just feel like my heart is so open right now, y'all. What's the lyrics of Formation? So something. I work hard. I grind till I own it. I think she says, I see it. I work hard. I grind till I own it. I don't remember what she says at the beginning, but whatever. She goes off. She gets what's hers. She's a Stark. She slays. You watch your mother live in this way. And when an experience like that happens in your life, you don't do what your parents say you should do. You do what they do. And that is so beautiful. Developing the receiver's mindset is not just about getting the shoes, even though I love the shoes. Y'all know that I love the shoes. I am doing the shit for the shoes. <laughs> Let me make that clear. I love the shoes. Pay me money <laughs> so I can get the shoes. But it's about those moments. I am so... <laughs> I'm not going to say I'm so excited for my children to experience adversity in their life. <laughs> but y'all, I will never stop telling that story. Whatever that looks like, because challenges are normal. Whether it's an internal or external experience. And I'm not the type of person who's like, oh my God, I'm going to raise my kid with the camera in their face. But you know what I'm saying? Just, I imagine... I don't even have the words to describe the pride that I would feel in seeing my child, my family, my flesh, my blood being committed to their goals and being strong in their convictions, being passionate about what they know to be true, trusting themselves, valuing themselves, valuing their gifts, and knowing that that's because in 2024, I was doing EFT tapping and meditating and journaling and scripting and going on rampages in my room in the dark when it was nobody and it was just me and God and the devil. <laughs> that real life human beings are gonna have a better life and are gonna be an even bigger, more powerful, positive impact on the world because of the shit that I'm doing right now. That's why you do it. That's how you overcome microaggressions like a fucking leader. You realize that when it's time to change, it's time to change. So I don't give a fuck what you think or who you are or who you know or how much money you have or how long you've been running this game and running this company and da 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 When it's time for change, it's time for change and I'm here. So guess what time it is? Hello. Can I get an amen, somebody? Rate this podcast five stars. <laughs> right now. <laughs> oh. God, that was one of the greatest podcast episodes I have ever recorded in my life. God, God, I love that. Okay, we're done with this episode. If you're listening to this, you're feeling fired up. You're like, I want to have the receiver's mindset for myself, not just for myself, but for future generations and for the women in my company who are coming up behind me because I am ready to receive on demand. I am ready to expect more in my workplace in terms of how I'm treated. And I am going to do a part two. Hold on. Pause that. Pause the pitch for a second. I'm going to do a part two where we get even more specific, but this is a really excellent foundational episode. Okay. So just look out for the part two. Okay. We're going to get technical on this is what you would do and this is how I would do it and all of that good stuff. So don't worry, Miranda, I got your back. Okay. Anyway, you want to know, you don't want to wait till the next episode. You're like, I want action steps now. I want to start shifting some shit now. I want to start handling my business. I want to be even stronger in my convictions and what I know to be true. How do I develop a mindset where I don't care to be likable, where I know that I get to receive? How do I build out a mindset where I have self-worth, where I know that I am an important, significant person who matters and belongs? How do I 
show up as the woman in the room who respects herself and who expects to be heard and who expects to be listened to and who expects things to go smoothly for her in the workplace and who actually receives and experiences that. How do I become that woman? My answer to your question, Miranda, it's a great question, by the way, is you enroll in the Receiver's Mindset course. I'm serious. It is incredibly powerful, okay? The Receiver's Mindset course is a three-module course, plus there are two bonus trainings. Inside, you are learning how to receive on demand. You're learning the nooks and crannies every single thing, the nooks and crannies of every single thing that I described in today's episode, specifically just in module one alone, you're going to learn how to assess your childhood and life experiences so that you can understand exactly why parts of you feel restricted and unsafe receiving what you want, right? Asking for the salary that you want, setting your boundaries in the workplace, don't speak to me that way, don't talk to me that way, right? You're going to be able to look at your own life experience to understand why you feel restricted and unsafe doing that, right? Why you feel powerless, okay? You're also going to learn how to identify and shift the limiting beliefs, right? Identify and shift those limiting beliefs that are rooted in shame and guilt and unworthiness, because those are the limiting beliefs that are holding you back from all that you desire. When we self-sabotage in our careers, it's always going to be because we have a limiting belief telling us that we're not going to be a good person if we get what we want, that it's going to be bad for us to get what we want, that it's going to be unsafe for us to get what we want. So you're going to learn how to shift that, move through that inside of module one. You're going to receive my process for building out your self-worth. And that process is based on the universal truth that it is good and right and fair for you to receive all that you desire. We really talked a lot about that today. This is like a masterclass, okay? You're also going to learn how I define and use my understanding of value to receive fair compensation for my time, my energy, and my efforts. And I do this in relationships, in my career, or anything else. And this is that portion of the course that's really going to support you in getting that dream salary. You're also going to learn how to unapologetically trust your desires so that you may receive regardless of what rules and standards the outside world has projected onto you. So if you are convinced that you're not getting the master's, you're not getting the PhD, or you're not getting the fucking bachelor's and you want this money and you want XYZ different type of thing and you trust yourself and you trust what you know, and you're ready to give your gifts to the world, this module is what's going to help you unlock lock that so that you can share your gifts and receive in exchange for them. You're also going to learn how to move through your fear. You're going to learn how to create an internal sense of safety and security. That's what I was actually talking about at the beginning of this episode. Was that this recording or the last one? I don't remember, girl. But anyway, you're going to learn how to create an internal sense of safety and security so that you can stay open to receiving even when you feel uncertain or doubtful, right? That's the fucking Reverend Shuttlesworth masterclass for you, okay? Even when you feel terrified, even when they're bombing your fucking home. How can you stay open to receiving even when you feel uncertain, even when you feel doubtful, even when you feel afraid? That's what you're learning inside of that course. And then you're also getting my seven step repeatable process for receiving now. And I love this process because what it does is consolidate the teachings of the entire course. And it just makes it easy to practice shifting your energy, develop supportive beliefs and magnetize your desires to you from moment to moment. So you're learning all of this shit across text and audio and video trainings. But the seven step repeatable process is something that you can memorize, screenshot and pull up from moment to moment to moment. So that you can actually integrate what you're learning inside of the course. And the last thing that you're getting inside of module one of this three module course, including bonuses, is you're, oh, excuse me, I have to burp. You're learning how to believe in and practice your inherent worthiness and good enoughness. So you can stop asking yourself, what do I need to fix or become in order to succeed or receive. I love that training around your inherent worthiness. It's really, really, really good. Okay. So 
If that interests you, you want to learn more about the Receiver's Mindset program, I highly suggest investing in it. I highly suggest joining me in it. I would love to support you if you feel called and you feel like it's your destiny to be inside, then it's my destiny to support you within it. And I'm super excited to serve you in that capacity. You can learn more and enroll today using the link in the show notes or the description if you are watching on YouTube. I love you so much. Thank you for hanging out with me for the last hour and a half. I hope that you also enjoy this episode and I'll talk to you in the next one. All right, for those of you who are watching the episode or listening on YouTube, then you can look at your screen and see the artwork that I created. My grandpa, who I referenced in today's episode, I really hope that I did. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like 99% sure that I did. I'm working on something else. So I didn't have time to listen to the full episode, but I'm like 90. Anyway, it's my grandpa on the far right, country singer, Mwah, chef's kiss. On the left is a photo that I took in Birmingham, Alabama. It's one of my favorite photos. It's a really old house. I don't know the story behind it, but I took the photo. I loved it. I messed around a little bit, edited it with like the lighting and stuff way back when I took it, when I visited Birmingham and I loved it. I had some pictures from the historical sites and stuff like that, but putting those two side by side, they fit perfectly. And it was just, it was everything that we needed it to be. So that's what it was. Um, yeah. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Music or wherever else, then you'll just be able to see the house and the artwork. But if you want to see the picture of my grandpa then you can listen on youtube okay i'm done talking now i love you and i'll talk to you in our next episode which will come on monday okay bye bye thanks for listening to today's episode if you laughed learned something new or just loved the time we spent together today please leave a review of the podcast so that it's easier for the other Mirandas of the world to find it too. And if you want to connect with me between episodes, I highly suggest joining our free Facebook group using the link in the show notes. Love you lots, and I'll see you in the next episode.